in this echo lab, how far off can this echo be from the, so how, how far off can that yellow diamond be from the green diamond that we have in our, in our plots? How, how, how different can they be in height? And so we take a look at that, and point one seems to do all right there. And finally, we have to set the parameters for the uh, classification tree. And we, di we did that using a test training paradigm. So that's how we go about uh, looking at our tuning parameters here. A little this plot offers a little justification also for uh, that choice of negative 2.2. What we have here is the, uh, the, uh, CD the empirical CDF for the inner arrival timings of data packets. The top panel here corresponds to the inner arrival timing corresponding to, um, client to data packets from the client that were keystrokes. And these down here correspond to data, client data packets that were not keystrokes. So clearly you can see that when we look at this uh, distribution here, this distribution is, uh, these inner arrival times tend to be much higher. And if we look at negative 2.2 here, which corresponds to about there, this is a basic exclusion we're using. So we're missing almost zero of the candidates. I mean, there's basically nothing that we're, we're, leaving, le we're leaving out here. Whereas we are eliminating a lot of um, potential of potential client data packets down here that don't fit the right timing profile, so we we eliminate a whole lot, but we don't we and we give up almost almost nothing with this uh, with this exclusion rule. As far as the um, the echo lag, this is a quick example from a number of our uh, known connections here, and what what you see here is that. This uh, was set at point one, and so point one, point one would correspond to. We want that we want that inner arrival timing to be between point one and negative point one. So these vertical these vertical bars here are exactly what we want to see. We don't want to see points off to the side because that would mean that we're excluding things we should not be excluding. And when you look at these distributions, you do notice that there's a few points that lie out here, far to the outside, and these are. Um, these are keystroke times that are way off, and what this corresponds to are these are packets, these are keystrokes that fall at the beginning of an epoch. So when you have an epoch begin, you might have had a whole lot of client data packets coming, um, coming in this direction, and almost no zero server data packets in the preceding epoch. And so you're going to have some um, that first packet's timing characteristics maybe um, slightly off, and that's what we see here. We, we see that those are the uh, few places that, that we miss here, and those correspond to the beginning of, um, of our epochs. So again, this exclusion rule here seems to be, uh, uh, be all right. Finally, this is a, uh, a little summary of performance uh, looking across the uh, trace two and trace three connections. When we look at it, uh, when we looked at it, we saw we, our effort here was to classify every client data packet as being either a keystroke or not a keystroke. And what this table corresponds to here is we're, we've got the truth here, um, so not keystrokes, there were 1,988 not keystrokes, and there were 378 keystrokes across these, across these connections. And when you, look, when you look at it, out of the keystrokes, we miss nine, and out of the not, keystro or, and out of the not keystrokes, we have, we have uh, five false positives. So five false positives, nine, uh, nine um, misses. Uh, our error rates seem to be fairly low here. And we did do uh, a quick comparison with uh, uh, some kind of standard out-of-the-box algorithms as far as regression and, uh, and classification trees and things like that. And there, our error rates seem to be uh, about between, between one quarter and one tenth of their error rate. So compared to some just out-of-the-box type procedures, performing the same classification task, we, we seem to do all right. One other point to note here that this is, uh, we've um, aggregated over both uh, bulk transfers and uh, interactive type connections. And there were zero false positives as far as keystrokes go on the, uh, on the uh, bulk transfers. So that, that was nice that we, were, uh, that we were missing where it was um, not to, uh, where it was important that we, or it was nice that we were getting it right where we were supposed to get it right. We, weren't, we didn't want to be getting, uh, finding file transfers that add keystrokes. We've, we've uh, also gone and applied this algorithm to uh, trace for that, uh, the data coming in, into the statistics department and leaving, going to the outside network. 
And when you first look at this, this is, this is the, um, what we have here. These labels are a little bit small, and they, uh, um, but the first line here corresponds to SSH, the second is SMTP, and the third is our unknown connections. And what you see here is almost 50% of the connections that we classify as having keystrokes are SSH, 35% uh, or so are SMTP, and 15% are, are, uh, are um, unknown. And so at first this is a, a little bit disturbing when we see, but again here we're just looking at connections that have any keystrokes. When we move one step further, we look at the performance uh, as far as how many keystrokes are we finding in these connections. And this provides us a, uh, a little bit better grasp on what's going on here. And when we look at this, we see that those connections that were SSH have far more keystrokes in them than those other protocols. So for instance, the SMTP uh, connections that we found with keystrokes, these packets that were, these connections that were classified as keystrokes had, all of them had two with the exception of one which had three keystrokes in it. So there were very small numbers of keystrokes in these um, under the other protocols that where we, were, where we were missing. And actually using the plotting tool we were able to identify that there seemed, there's a handshake that goes on at the end of the SMTP that uh, produces a false positive as far as the keystroke goes. And we saw the same thing, there was one connection with IMAPS and the unknowns, again, again for the most part the unknowns had a small number of keystrokes too. So that, that, was, that was a nice sign here that hopefully we're doing, hopefully we're doing something that's all right. As far, so we can uh, make our connection level prediction a little bit better. And we do this by revising our prediction rule. We say maybe we shouldn't classify a keystroke connection as a connection that has just one key, one keystroke doesn't make a keystroke connection. Maybe it needs to have some minimum number of keystrokes in there. And so, as an example of a uh, direction to go here, we take a look at what if we made that five? It, it seems like it's going to take five keystrokes to get something done anyway. And once you do something like that, you have a, about 90% of the connections, 90% um, of the connections with keystrokes become SSH, and a little, um, a little less than 10% are those unknown. And we've gotten rid of the SMTP and the the IMAPs, things like that. And so that's kind of nice. And it's uh, somewhat promising as far as uh, where to go from here. But again, this is a work in progress. So uh, there is, uh, this is definitely not the final conclusion here. As far as our future work here, I, I think, as I just said, that we can review the classification rules for defining a keystroke connection. Additionally, all, we need to know what's going on with these unknown connections. What, what are, what's actually going on? with the unknown connections. Those unknown connections are protocols that we don't know. But th there's got to be, um, there's got to be a way to investigate that. And so uh, hopefully we will um, be able to work with uh, the department and get a hold of, uh, sync this up with uh, our anonymized data and put, bring these two things together and come up with a little more intuition for what we are seeing. And finally here, since this is a work in progress, I thought it would be, um, well, I wanted to open up to any suggestions or questions you might have as far as, uh, uh, your, your thoughts on this or where to go from here. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the gist of it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, when, um, when you're actually logging this uh, information where the packets are coming in and going out, where where is that logger located? Is it on the server side? Is it on the client side? Is it at a router? Or where is the monitor, the network monitor located? Well, um, as far as uh, as far as oh, I wish I could draw a picture here for you. As far as um, yeah, huh? Well, tell, tell you what, I'll I'll go through each one of the traces, and each one of the traces is slightly a uh, slightly different situation. For instance, in the in the Leipzig uh, situation, they had something between the department and the outside, and the instances of the connections that we manually created that was um, uh, we were running TCP dump, uh, TCP dump on uh, our, our machine so the monitor would have been at one of the endpoints and in the case of the uh, the, de the department there's a the monitor was uh, between the yeah I guess it was set up basically at the department but just as you exit the department from the backbone of the department to the to the um, to the outside is where the network monitor is set there. Yes. 
Did you did you look at all about uh, with any distinction in terms of distance or or length?